Hi everybody, I'm uh, Patrick Boulder, I'm Chief Evangelist of Homeless Service Management. Um, and I'm going to be uh, talking you through the truth about Service Catalog. I've got a esteemed colleague joining me, so um, Barclay Ray. Barclay's an independent consultant. I've known Barclay for well over a decade now. He's one of my co-hosts on ITSM Weekly, the podcast. And Barclay's uh, been through consulting projects and seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of Service Catalog implementation. Uh, and he can provide you some sound practical advice. And at the end, we'll have time for some Q&A. So I'll crack straight on because we've got a lot of ground to cover today. So the first thing I say is service catalogs, they're not a new concept. Uh, they've been mentioned in ITIL v2, they took center stage in ITIL v3, but if you look at businesses, businesses are using them all the time. If we go back to the, the earliest concept of a catalog, I suppose something like the IKEA or the Sears catalog here, we could basically use these items to understand what goods were going to cost us, when they were available, and all of that good stuff. Um, but basically, we then moved on to more the Internet of Things, where we have uh, the Amazon um, interface, Amazon.com, uh, and basically now we'll get suggested uh, other things that could probably um, that could probably help us, um, accessories we could order, uh, when our, our our options for actually ordering a faster delivery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and probably one of the simplest examples here is down at the bottom of the McDonald's menu. So I can walk into a McDonald's restaurant and I understand that ordering a number four meal is going to get me a quarter pounder, some fries, and a, a, a Diet Coke or something along those lines. That's the packaging and bundling of those components that make up that service. It sets my expectations. If I want to order extra, maybe go large or order something else along with it, I know that that's going to cost me extra. And really, that's where we need to head in terms of development of the IT service catalog. So um, just from there, we'll move straight on to why a service catalog is important for IT. Well, Don Page really asked this question at a presentation I delivered a while ago, and he talked about, is your IT organization delivering, demonstrating, and managing the services your customers need? A lot of IT organizations really struggle to answer that question. So the fact is, unless you are actually doing that, unless you can manage those services and understand them, how can you possibly hope to improve them going forward? So that's the big challenge for us. To put it in context as to why a service perspective is actually important, um, just take a look at this network diagram here. So on the left-hand side, we have a, a switch that's gone out of action. We've got a printer, and we've got a, a workstation, or perhaps a server of some description. Um, which one should we access first? Which one should the service desk pay most attention to? Well, a lot of the time we rely on people to make those decisions because uh, we rely on the description from the, the person making the call or the IT person's um, decision as to which we should address first. Well, the fact of the matter is, until we truly understand the service that, that's been impacted by that particular failure, we can't really make that call. So the moment we put a service perspective on this, we see that there's three services affected. So the first service is the time and, time and attendance service, the one in green. And what that means is people arriving for work um, can't clock in. It doesn't stop them arriving for work. And yes, it's important that we can see people registering as they arrive to work. But actually, it's not going to really impact our business in a massive way. So we'll get around to it as quickly as we can. On the right-hand side in yellow, we have the finance service. So this may mean that we can't generate invoices. Now, that's going to have an impact on our business. But perhaps this has happened during the middle of the month when, in fact, uh, they're not doing an invoice run. So again, although it's a high priority, perhaps the urgency is not as high as it might otherwise be at the end of a month when we're doing invoice runs. What may look like a, a rather innocuous failure, just a, a, a printer being out of action, actually, that's part of our delivery service. This is the printer that prints the dockets, so the trucks leave our warehouse uh, with the right goods for our customers. If goods are not going out, that's really going to impact our, our customer perception of service and, and our service in general. So clearly, that one in red is the one we should be prioritizing, but we only really get a true understanding of that once we take a service perspective. Right, so why should you develop a service catalog? I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, recording will be available. You can look through them in your own time. But the important ones for me are the one right at the top, driving the service perspective. We've already seen in the previous slide how that, that, that delivers benefit uh, and some clarity. 
To ensure the delivery of standardized services, that's important. Every time we customize services, it gets expensive. The more we can standardize, the better quality we can deliver, uh, and the more we can do that with a degree of consistency and predictable cost and resource consumption as we deliver those services. And finally, at the bottom, is to make and keep your promises. You're actually delivering these services to the business, and you've got to say, if this is important, we'll respond within a particular period of time, and you've got to be able to deliver against that particular promise. So to me, all of those things are important, but the, the service perspective, standardizing, and making and keeping your promises are the three bullet points that I would say are the most important from my perspective here. So. Service catalog has different service perspectives. So um, if you look at the bottom, we've got the IT perspective. So these are the, the boxes, the technology that supports that service, the underpinning IT system, shall we say. Then from the user's perspective, it's largely uh, the components they're running. So perhaps they've got uh, uh, the facility to create an order. Perhaps they've got a facility for, um, for product management on there. That's the user's perspective. That's all they care about. They can care about the underlying infrastructure. And then from the business perspective, we have the processes that those systems depend upon. So that's really the context. Now, and we have different levels of visibility depending on who wants to see what and what role they play within the business. Right, so why is it important to drive this service perspective? Well, really, when you're buying anything, think about yourself as a consumer. What do you want to know about anything that you buy or anything that you order? Um, basically, you want to know what it is and how you're going to get it. How do you use it? And what happens if it goes wrong? So where do I go to for help? Where do I, who do I call in the event that this thing stops working? Um, and actually, if I do order it, how quickly am I going to get it? There's probably another thing you could add there. Are there other things that are connected to this service that I might be interested in. So you know you go to Amazon and you order a printer cartridge, you may say actually you might want some paper, etc. So there are other options there. And there are other things like cost. So what does it cost for me to order this? And perhaps are there things that I can do to reduce the cost? So if I buy in volume, if I uh, sign up to a lower level of service, that may help me. And then from an IT perspective, we need to understand What's consumed? So what are the other bits within our infrastructure that we need to be managing to make sure that this service is, uh, is available? Um, systems and processes, um, other information that service level management may need about that service to do a proper interface with the business and negotiate how we should be providing those services. And then the metrics that surround that. So are we actually delivering the services that our customers want and need? Right, so what the service catalog should really offer you uh, of agility, clarity, and measurability. So agility, um, really the ability for us within IT to quickly get services into operation. So we support rather than hinder the development of those services. And, and to get different services on different technology platforms, actually the business doesn't care what platform we're using. It cares about the service. So being able to replicate those services is going to be important onto different platforms as the need arises and perhaps we get our hands on better products to be able to do that. Clarity I think is very important. So explaining to the business what we do and what we don't do, what is and what's not included. Understanding how much demand there is for a service and actually who's entitled to what across the business. And then from a measurability perspective, reporting our performance against service targets, not the number of incidents we've logged in isolation or in total, um, but actually performance against the service itself and understanding what's actually required of us, what does it cost, how much of it is being used, and then managing that capacity um, so that we can begin to predict what the demand is going to be like as we do our IT and business planning. A few examples of this, um, I've got here just um, a set of measures, if you like, that you might have for a given service. So this is just an SAP, Enterprise Resource Planning application. And the technical metrics, we're looking at availability. So the one we want to measure is 100% of uptime. That's what we're aiming for. Four nines is our benchmark. And that clearly describes what actually, what, what dependency we have on that. So um, we've got less than nine minutes of downtime available to us per month. Perhaps that's our maintenance windows. And it has a consequence. What happens if that's not available? It means the business cannot process financial transactions. We can immediately understand if someone's calling up at the end of the month from our accounts team to say, this service is, is impacted. Well, then we understand the consequence of that service not being available. 
from a business point of view, they, they're interested in, in transaction volumes. So they've got a target of 7,500 invoices, a benchmark of 5,000, and again, we've got a, a description and a consequence. Customer satisfaction, and this one we're aiming for, a, we got a target of nine. I don't know why we wouldn't have a target of 10, which you surely aim for to, to please, keep customers really happy, but there you go, that's what's using the measurement. Um, and a benchmark of eight, and again, we have a description and a consequence. And finally, we got some support options. So here we're giving the customer a choice and we're affecting their behavior by saying, if you want 24 by seven support, then that's available to you, but there will be a higher cost associated with that. Uh, customers may then say, actually 12 by five is fine for us. So again, you're modifying customer's behavior based on the support options and the cost of a given service. Right, um, so, uh, how would you go about designing this? Well, there's a lot of mistakes, I think, that IT organizations make. So developing a service catalog in isolation, i.e. not talking to the business, doing it yourself, you're just simply not going to get it right. Uh, attempting to define everything, so boiling the ocean, so we've got to get it all into one of these service catalog documents or whatever, you, you won't get it right. You won't get it right at the first attempt. You may get it 60, 70, or perhaps even 80% right, but Getting it done is better than getting it perfect. Um, not making it actionable. So sending out a Word document to your customers and expecting them to use that simply won't happen. You've got to make it actionable. Also, inadequate uh, customer communication. So the belief that actually we'll build one and they'll flock to it simply won't happen. You have to instill the benefits and, and coach customers in its use. And then a lack of integration into other uh, processes or tools. So Really, you have to have good governance to make sure that it's up to date, and customers need to be able to raise service requests, report incidents, and, and all that good stuff. So that has to be in place for this to be effective. The most important point on this entire slide, I would say successful service catalogs are designed from the customer in, not from the infrastructure out. We already mentioned governance, but you really have to have that engagement with the customer. So what I'd say is keep it simple when you start. Consider perhaps starting with critical services, Maybe you've got a friendly marketing team or a friendly sales team or something along those lines that can basically help you to define some of this for their department. You can start with something as, as easy as post-it notes on a wall, that's fine, but you have to aim to create an actionable service catalog. There's some really good examples of leaders here. So, so Dell, I've just picked those out of a selection of many, but what they get right is they bundle stuff. And they basically make it very clear to you that actually the, the, the image on the left-hand side, the Dell, Dell Precision T3400, I don't have an option to customize, but it's relatively cheap. So that's what I get. That's available to me. It's a standard build. Every time we customize and we add something else, it costs us more. And the business customer needs to understand that that's the case. We can provide a service. If you want something different, then we have to charge you a little bit more. Okay, so bundling is the way to go. In terms of the technology, how you might use that, well, this is just an example for our own support works tool. So across the top here, you've got all of the components that you would expect to have within a service, cost and subscriptions, baselines, associated requests, media, perhaps you have disk images for applications, knowledge base articles. And down at the bottom for that service, you've got service options. What are the standard components that are packaged within this particular service? And what are the optional components? So I can have all of these if I request this service, it gives me that stuff as standard, and the optional stuff then is offered to me as a choice to affect and modify that behavior. So what it looks like from the customer's point of view, on the left-hand side, we get access by our self-service portal. They can request support, they can look at our authorizations and all the other good stuff. They can actually flag things as favorite services. So if it's something I'm requesting all the time, just have it up there in favorites and allow you to raise the request describes what the service is, describes the components of that service. And then underneath, you've got the services that you have available to you. And you'll notice it's not just IT services. You can bring in things like uh, HR. You can bring in things like um, your facilities and estates. Um, those can all be listed in a service catalog with allocation of calls to different service desks from a single platform. Also, you get access to services you can subscribe to. Perhaps you haven't got them at the moment, but you can subscribe to them, and in this case, services I own. So what happens when a service request comes in is basically it has all the customer information, the detail about what that service actually is, and then on the business process details tab, we have a facility to allow the customer to track 
how that request is actually progressing. So the progress starts, um, uh, something's actually received, people build stuff, and eventually the customer gets what they've asked for. But this allows them to track uh, that progress and prevents calls to the service desk to say, what's happening with my new service request, please? So that's the outline. I hope that was useful. Um, I'll give you, leave you with an example that um, one of our customers cleverly did. So they actually hooked the content from their service catalog into the supplier's website. So every time the supplier's website gets updated, so service gets updated. Really clever move. What the user can then do is to say, I want one of these. And when they do, they get through, taken through a wizard saying, uh, how many, in this case, it's a phone. So they're saying, what kind of package would you like? Do you need GPS and push to talk, et cetera? It asks all of this information tied back to the actual service request. And then once that's been progressed, the authorizations have been done, and customers can track the progress by self service. Very simple, very effective. OK, so what I'm going to do now is pass you over to um, my good friend, Barkley Ray. Um, and I want Barkley to talk to you uh, about the nuts and bolts of doing this. So let me just give Barkley presentation rights. And Barkley, please introduce yourself. Hello there. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, very nice to be talking to everybody. And I'll just sort out the technology here. Hopefully, you can now uh, see my screen. And um, very interesting introduction there. Um, talking about some of the key elements, I think one of the most important things, uh, as Patrick mentioned, is actually just getting started. Um, I think good enough is maybe not as good as perfect, but it's certainly better than trying to be perfect and failing. And I think with a lot of this kind of stuff, it is very much about um, being realistic and practical and not trying too much to be perfect and do everything um, in the most precise way, particularly from the point of view of, st of where you start. You have to start top down. You have to start about thinking about the business. And in thinking about this and looking at it um, with the white paper we've done as well, we, we, we've going to use the, the analogy of a restaurant. If you go into a restaurant and ask for, you know, ask for a meal, you expect a menu. You expect to be given some options because without the options, Nobody has any idea how to do this. Okay, you've got people who can cook. You've got you. You might have some ingredients, and you might have some expectations as, as a customer of of what sort of food you might get. But you might ask for something that's not in the kitchen. They may not have got that kind of uh, those kind of ingredients. Um, and although they may rustle something up for you, there may be different expectation about cost as well. So what what the what the menu gives is it gives the customer the options to choose from. Uh, it's not an exhaustive option. The, the McDonald's example is a good one because that's very, very simple and straightforward. But it also gives the catering staff, the chef, all those people clear guidelines on what they need to do to deliver that. So what food they need to buy, what they need to have in, what kind of volumes, um, and how they need to plan in the morning before lunchtime in terms of preparation to be able to deliver that over the lunchtime period. There's no point going in and ordering a lunch at 12 o'clock and it only comes at 4 o'clock. It's got to be delivered in a certain way. So the, the menu, the service catalog is there to help everybody, and everybody's got a slightly different take on it as well. The customer will see the, the tip of the iceberg, what's the stuff that we're going to get. But behind that, you've got lots of other documentation in the kitchen as to how you will deliver that. Um, for example, you will have recipes that refer to the items within the within the menu. Uh, and the example there for IT is that there will be different information for the IT organization in order to, to deliver the service. So just quickly, we're going to look at some very practical examples of what we need to do to make this work. I think the, the, the takeaway from this session is really that you can get started. You know where to start. You know what to do and what kind of things you, you, you should be trying to achieve. One of the first things that we look at, we, we've got a we've got a route map that you can have a look at later on, uh, is is feasibility, and, and so you have to be really clear as to what kind of value you want to get out of this. Um, and there are three main areas: satisfaction, customer satisfaction, by setting realistic expectations around about service delivery, then you've got a chance of meeting those, and also then telling the customer that you that, that you're meeting those. Um, Customer satisfaction is, is, is a changing, constantly changing thing. That Why does Coca-Cola advertise 
even though they've probably got the coal market pretty much covered. Well, they know that you're only as good as your last service, you're only as good as your last good service, and you have to keep reminding people of not only your product, but why it's good and why it's good for them. So customer satisfaction is something that we, we have to keep on top of. And through service catalog and, and managing the expectation, we've got a much better chance of controlling that. Cost and efficiency. The real cost efficiency comes through self-service request management, cutting out the paper chase, cutting out the automation, cutting out the the, the chasing around of, of requests, things that lie in people's desks for a couple of days or a couple of weeks without being actioned. If it's all done automatically, then it's going to cut, it, cut down the time and the cost. And then finally, and probably most importantly, reduce, you know, Im improving your metrics, improving the way that you actually um, report on what you do and how you define value. We're always talking about defining value. Value is, is it's different in each organization. But it, if you are able to understand what value each service actually delivers to your organization, then you could put some measures around that and report back to the organization. And the organization will appreciate much more what IT actually does. So those are the main headings. And I think in each organization, you have to look at what we're trying to achieve. With any project, you must be clear at the outset as to what you're trying to achieve. And if you can identify areas where you can either improve cost or simply be able to explain better to the organization what it is you're doing and why you're doing it in a certain way, um, then that's clear. There are some other more specific um, things that we can look at in terms of benefits. Business mandate, I think, is, is the best one. I, I always talked about services and SLAs as breathing life into the ITIL processes. The ITIL processes are there, but without some kind of business mandate for what they are and what they're doing, they are just simply a fairly mechanical set of processes. But if your ITIL processes are based around achieving certain business goals, then they are much more relevant both to IT and to its customers. Um, I think really overall that the, the, the point at the bottom, IT moves from a technical and system focus to a service and business focus, is the real one. This, this is the catalyst for achieving that. This is, the, for me, the central point of IT service management. Um, service catalog will help the organization to move forward and better understand what it's delivering and how it presents that back to the customers. The other point there that I think is important is that you can't do S you can't do SLAs without having a service catalog in place. And we, we often do that. We often ask somebody to go and set up SLAs without thinking about what the services actually are. And the tail wagging the dog. Very often that person maybe he doesn't have the authority in the organization or the experience and skills to be able to do that and the whole thing fails and you end up with a you know a, maybe a poor view within the inside the organization as to what service level management SLAs and service catalog actually is but those things are, are important um, what tends to happen as I said in terms of challenges is, is you may have had a failed project and that can have some baggage going forward so if you're trying to do this again people go oh well you know we had this hey, you know, we had this project a few years ago and, and it, it didn't work. Well, it probably didn't work because it wasn't properly approached or it wasn't fully thought through. And that's that's no great fault of the people doing it other than just the fact that it needs to be considered carefully. And, and our implementation approach that we suggest is to say, look, the implementation part of this is actually quite straightforward, but you've got to sort out a few strategic things. You've got to think about the design of the services. You've got to do some thinking up front to get it right, and then the implementation will be a lot more smooth. A um, few other things there, defining the, the processes of, defining the services first before and trying to build SLAs, getting everybody on the same page and, and being clear on definitions. If you get 10 people in a room and you ask them all what their definition is of an SLA or a service catalog, I guarantee you they'll all have something slightly different. And what's important is not so much that there's a, some kind of industry standard definition. I mean, these things are useful, but what's important is that in your organization, you're all working to the same set of definitions. Uh, and if everybody's doing that, then I can guarantee you it saves you a lot of time down, downstream because I've been in loads of projects where we've been three months, four months into the project and suddenly, suddenly somebody's gone, but I thought an SLA was a contract or I thought an SLA was this. 
and we then had to go and backtrack to 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 work, you know, to be to clarify what we meant. I think we can cover those things off fairly quickly if we, if we take the, the workshop approach and just say, right, we're going to spend the first half day on this, making sure that we understand exactly what we mean by service, service level agreement, operational level agreement, service offering, and so on. Just, just, just be absolutely clear on that. We'll have a look at that in a second as well. So, moving forward, one other thing just to think about, or, or sets of things to think about approaching service catalogue. You may run into some of these, and these these are described a lot more detail in our white paper. But um, you know, the service catalog is not just the front end, the portal. It's that's the visible part to the customers, but beneath beneath the surface, like an iceberg, there's loads of other layers. And as I mentioned in the restaurant analogy, you see the menu, but the the kitchen staff see the recipes and all the other things that, that go with that. Um, it won't solve all of your problems. It will help you to solve some of your problems, but don't expect it to be a, an absolute silver bullet. Um, you might save money, and you might be able to get it done quickly, but again, based on realistic planning and expectations. Um, to some extent, it is a view of a CMD, because what it takes is information from a CMD and bundles it into service packages. But it's not like a CMDB, uh, particularly not in terms of levels of detail, it's much more business level detail. And certainly for things like how we engage with a business, don't even bother trying to do this with a view that, well, we'll do this ourselves and uh, maybe we'll then we'll show it to the business. And you know, I'd recently had experience of that where I, where I was doing a service catalog project but was told that I couldn't actually engage with the business to do it. And you know, it, it really was just like uh, trying to work completely in the dark. You have to get the business on board. It has to be based on a discussion and engagement with business customers. Otherwise, you risk looking a bit stupid because you can just go and set something up that's even more irrelevant than what you've currently got. So the other final thing is that there's misconception is that there are different types of catalog or there are several different catalogs. We do talk about different views of a catalog. We do talk about the customer view, the user view, the IT view, the technical view. And these are simply, you know, different views of the same repository of information. It doesn't mean that there are different catalogs, but there are just, you know, you only present information that's relevant to each group rather than presenting them with them all. And historically that's what we've done. Um, we've, we've built service catalogs, usually in a spreadsheet or a Word document, that just includes information for everybody. And in fact, you know, 70% of it is irrelevant to everybody, so it's not really very successful. So a few things just to think about before we start. Here's a look at what we've come up with in terms of the, the route map. And this, as I said, is based upon a lot of experience of doing this. I think there are three main stages. Um, strategy, design, and implementation. You know, it's not a million miles away from the five um, stages we have in ITIL, but just, just to, for simplicity, I think it's important that we think about it in those terms. Real kind of high level of work up front that includes the workshops, getting the momentum going, the design phase, building a, a set of services and some of the information documentation around it. And then the implementation part, which actually, as I mentioned, although it may be quite time consuming and, and it may be the longest part of the project and involve the most resources, tools, processes, and so on, it requires less um, discussion once you've done, done that early on. So you have to do that early on get everything clear, and then implementation is relatively mechanical because it is then just simply doing what you've defined and, and setting that in motion, whether it be simply through um, you know, a, a portal with request management and then moving on to things like the business view and the technical view. All those things can come together through a tool set <laughs> once you've done the initial work. But don't just dive into implementation. Don't just go out and buy a tool and then think, right, we'll stick that in and we'll get it working, you know, without having done some of this work. Otherwise, it, it will fail. So just a little bit more detail around those three phases. Strategy, you need to be clear on what your objectives are, what you're going to do with this, what kind of benefits it will give. And, and that doesn't need to take a lot of time, but you know, are we just doing this to save money? Are we doing it to improve our service? Are we doing it to improve our reporting visibility? 
Workshops, probably the most important part, and for me, over the years, this is the bit that really has been the turning point. It's almost like a rite of passage. If you get the key stakeholders together in a room for a day, uh, and that includes some business people, it includes some senior IT people, it includes some project people, and work through two things. One, you're clear on the definitions, and you do a little bit of education around about what this whole process is. Then everybody's on the same page, less opportunity for misunderstanding. And then in the second half of the day, you actually start to brainstorm what are our high level services? What what is the framework that we're working to? How do we define what it is we do? And out of that day you've got momentum, you've got uh, consensus, you've got some drive to move it forward. And you've also got some content because you've actually started to think about what the services are. So for example, with a very simple grid like this you can say what are the services? What, is, what do they do, who are the customer, who are the users, um, what is involved from the IT perspective in actually delivering that. And you can actually build that into a fairly simple framework. But you know, if you do that for 10, 15 services, you've done really well in a day. You might also then think about the definitions. Here's the ones that I think are the, the most basic ones for a service catalog. What do they mean in our organization? Well, that's that's just simply a set of definitions. What I've also found is that organizations tend, if you look at the third column, to have some of those things in place already and different names for them. Well, just note what they are in our current organization and decide whether or not you're going to keep those um, definitions or not. Um, but it's important, I think, just to do those things and, and be clear, and in, in a day, as I said, you can get a huge amount of momentum going. Then you start looking at talking to the customer. And, and again, so important to emphasize this and to build on this and to think, right, well, we're not just going to start internally. We're not going to start inside out. As we say, we're going to start outside in. We're going to look at the customer experience first and think about what they need from IT. Talk to them, get input in their own words. I've found over the years it's quite simple to the best way is, is to give them some guidelines, but don't just present them with a fully fledged document. Give them some ideas of the things that you think, but let them define it in their own words. And they will value that. They will value the number of times they've done that. And then they've said, oh, it's great to be asked by IT, not just told by IT. The other thing you would think about at this stage is starting to define what we mean by a service and what the, what the attributes of a service are. So. What is it? A little bit more detail from that initial grid that I showed you, but you know you can build that in, and that's the sort of thing that Patrick was showing you with the the forms that they had on on the, on the Hornbill system. It is simply understanding for each service what things we're going to capture and and how we're going to capture that. So that first bit gets you going, got a bit of momentum. Then we move on to actually going back to the IT organisation, um, being a bit diplomatic being a bit strong as well, making sure that you get the, the ideas across. And you can then start to think about designing your services. What what information do we need? What levels of information do we need? There's a potential for a huge amount of documentation, but you need to just think about that in terms of who needs what and who needs to see what. But at a very high level, you need to keep it simple. Uh, and some things will be referenced rather than in the full documentation what processes are needed, what governance is needed to maintain them. Start to build the documentation, keep it simple, uh, and don't just give that to a technical person. You need to have technical focus at this point because you need to be thinking about how you're bundling up your service packages, what the links are, both to other processes and to other technical areas like configuration management, for example. But it shouldn't be driven by a technical person. It needs to be, it needs to be strongly thought of from the business perspective. And you know, once we're starting to think about different views, we have to think about the outputs. So the, the user request part will be a very simple, it will be a, a, a small number of choices. The business service catalog view is simply more about things like reporting, dashboards, information on performance, supply and demand, and so on, rather than giving them choices or giving them technical information. And of course, the technical and the IT guys, they need things like what are the OLAs, what are the contracts, what are the technical requirements, which bits of the CMDB does this relate to. What you then start to build is your hierarchy of services, your, your, your framework, 
And you know, when you have your workshops, for example, you'll be arguing about you know whether or not PDAs go under here or under here. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. This is just an example. But what it does give you is, is, is a view that this is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve something that is meaningful to us about the services that we deliver. What we are also seeing more and more is that this model is being applied to other areas like facilities and HR. I think Patrick mentioned that as well. Um, but the main thing is that we start to have some kind of structure for our services that builds for us a model that we can then use to put together our processes, our support processes, our contracts, our SLAs, and et cetera, to meet those. The final thing about this for me is just actually thinking about this in terms of outcomes. And we, you know, we're still very focused. We, we do tend to overcomplicate things in IT. We're very focused on making you know, tying up to the, to the CMDB, all that kind of stuff. I think we need to get back to the basics about what we're trying to do in terms of outcomes. And by outcomes, I mean, you know, what is the business outcome? There's no point building a bridge and spending a lot of time and money doing that if the first car that goes over it tumbles down into the into the sea. What matters is your moment of truth. What is the thing that actually all this infrastructure and skill and, and, and investment actually leads to? And what that is is things like this. Customers buying from your website staff being able to access records, people getting information, check EPOS systems working, all that kind of stuff. Why not measure them as your absolute and ultimate service outcomes? These aren't services here. These are outcomes of services. We are focused still on delivering a whole pile of IT stuff that contributes to a business outcome. But actually, more and more organizations are now doing that, where they are measuring, even the IT departments are measuring themselves, the success of what they're doing based on you know, how many boxes of conflicts they, they make per day or whether the ambulance service was able to get the emergency vehicles to an accident within the specified time. And I think that's a really strong message to, to be giving out. The final thing is implementation, as I mentioned. And, you know, it's here we're into project management. Get the right people, the right skills, the right approach. You need to have some strong, strong personalities to make sure it gets done. You'll be meeting a lot of people that don't want to do this for various reasons. Um, and it's it, you know you also need to make sure that you build in ongoing maintenance to keep the information about services current and relevant, and all that sort of thing needs needs to happen quickly. Here's another way of looking at what you need to do as a project. The service level management part is in the middle. You need to go and talk to customers, ask them some simple questions. You need to talk to IT and ask them some probably more complex questions. But ultimately, you've got two sources of outputs. They all need a certain type of information. They all need a certain type of information. And it's not the same thing. As a final view, this is my kind of understanding of what service level management and ultimately IT service management does or should be doing. And that's about having a simple agreed set of business goals that support is working towards or IT is working towards. We need to measure and review that. We need to set up the services, people, systems to make sure that we're delivering that and we need to review our performance, discuss it with our customers, and make sure that they also know that we're doing a good job. We're not really very good at publicizing and marketing our successes. And remember the Coke thing again. They, they don't forget that. Every day they're, they're starting from scratch. Every day we are starting from scratch to make sure that our credibility and our quality is there. And that, I think, you know, as, as a guiding principle, we've talked about all the different levels of service catalog and the approach and so on. but we should be thinking about business goals, business outcomes. How are we contributing towards that? All of our contact details are there. So if anyone wants to get in touch with us, um, you've got a, a whole host of different telephone numbers for me here. Barkley has actually given out his cell phone number, so he's a, he's a braver man than I am. Um, but you've got his email address and his, his website. We do have a white paper that Barkley referred to, um, um, and it, it expands on some of the things that we discussed here. So go ahead and download that, and uh, hopefully you'll find it useful. So, okay. Um, we've been asked um, some questions by some people here. Um, and the first question really is, is back to Barkley. So, Barclay, you were saying that really junior staff or, or kind of technical place, uh, people shouldn't be doing the kind of consultation with the input for the service catalog. So um, we've had a question asking, you exp uh, could you expand on that? Um, why, why would you uh, not employ junior staff to do that type of thing? 
Well, I would hope that would be fairly self-explanatory, but I mean, the point is that, you know, we are talking about fairly serious and, and critical um, sets of negotiation, fairly, you know, important points about the future direction of not only the IT organization, but the business as a whole. And um, the, the reason that it's meant that we mention it is because, you know, I do see this happening quite a lot where it's given to I suppose whoever's free at the time or you know in some cases an intern or a student or, or something like that just to go and go and write the SLAs and go you know and they end up having to it's a thankless task for them because one they don't understand enough about the organization and the people in the business and two they don't really get what it is that they have to do which is effectively to be a bit of a diplomat, negotiator, arbitrator, conciliator, whatever you want to call it, and and get consensus, you know, and that involves being quite tough with people and but also being able to cope with quite a lot of detail and information and boil it down to what's important, not just focus on, you know, you're not sitting there endlessly arguing about very fine points of detail when actually you have a, the big picture approach. So I think it's a mixture of, you know, needing people who are good at those kind of things, negotiation, uh, having good communication skills, um, having good di diplomatic and tact um, skills and, and, and capability, and also having a good sense of, you know, respect across the organization of organizations that they are negotiating with, um, which doesn't fall naturally into what, a, you know, what a relatively younger or more junior person can do. Yeah, very sensible. I mean, if you're going to use service catalog as a strategic tool, uh, yeah. then really you have to have more strategic kind of input and, and a degree of control and uh, and direction from strategic staff, I suppose. So. Well, it's, it's a bit like, you know, what, what we've seen for years where you go and talk to a, a CIO and they, and they say, oh, yeah, service is important to us. Our service desk is the most important, you know, and they've, they are hiring you know, they've got really um, unskilled and cheap people in doing those tasks. And I don't mean cheap in a disparaging way. I just mean people who are not suited to do that. You know, the, you need to have good people on a service desk and you need to have experienced people who are doing negotiation. Uh, it's very interesting that almost every success story that I hear about of the um, the uh, presentations I get involved in, almost every one of them are talking about how they recruit customer service professionals and pay them good money to sit on the service desk to make a difference. And that's almost without fail every single service desk example where they're, they're talking about their success, they, that that's the model that they use. So the next question is for me, um, can you have a service catalog without a CMDB? Uh, yes, would be my <laughs> simple answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, not 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 brushing that to one side, but let me give you an, an analogy. Um, I, as Barclay, I'm sure you've seen this time and time again. But I have seen literally hundreds of CMDB projects that uh, that really get initiated, probably with questionable value. So if anyone says to me, "I'm going to implement the CMDB," uh, the first question I'll always ask them, and you would be surprised at how many people get stumped by this: um, What's the problem you're trying to solve? or what's the business value you're trying to deliver. Because my, my advice there would be, unless you can articulate the business value of what you're trying to do, it may give you some IT value, but how's that going to be visible to the business? It might reduce your costs, but is the cost of doing it and the effort expended in doing it actually worth, um, uh, worth it in the long term in terms of the value you return? So to, you, to give you my analogy, it's quite simple. Um, if I took, if someone's going to build a CMDB and I brought them on into the room, big technical team, and I take out a jigsaw, which has got 10,000 pieces on the jigsaw, and I dump it in the middle of the table and say, there you go, guys, sort that out. And then what I do is I put the picture that's on the jigsaw box behind my back and don't let them see it. It's going to take them forever to actually put that jigsaw together. Uh, they may not even, even be able to do it. That, to me, is what it's like to build a CMDB without having the overall picture. And, of course, that picture... That's your, um, that's your service catalog. That's your menu, as Barclay described earlier, the analogy we use in the paper. 
I, there's no point in me putting a whole heap of ingredients together, to use the restaurant analogy, unless I know precisely what it is I'm trying to deliver. So the, the, the menu, the high-level items in the service catalog, I would say if you're developing a CMDB, you have to be doing service catalog in tandem with that, or at least defining your services in tandem with that. Um, okay, so next question is um, for Barclay. Barclay, should there be an internal catalog and an external catalog? Oh, that's a trick question, Patrick. Um, it depends what you mean by that, but uh, I think that's maybe relating to the, you know, what I mentioned earlier, that there are different views. It's all the same information. The catalog is, the catalog, if you describe it as the, you know, the, the Sears catalog, for example, that's just the, the very tip of the iceberg part. It's a whole pile of information that is pulled together about what we need to do for the service. So to use the restaurant analogy again, um, it's it's not as if we present the customer with the recipes and all the other information that they need in the kitchen about, you know, um, lists for buying food and, um, you know, procedures for cleaning and all that kind of stuff. Um, you need to have, you need to present the right information to the right people in the right format when they need it, not all the information all together at one time. And you wouldn't present the, as I say, you wouldn't present the um, buying schedule for potatoes to the customer. What you present to the customer is the menu and the bill, and that's all they need to see. Um, so the, the, it's not as if, and we do talk about different types of catalog view, and the technical catalog, the business catalog, the user request portal, all those kind of things. These are, these are terms that have come up in the last few years, and I, I don't think we've all really as an industry completely got our heads around exactly what those things are. I mean, I think that once you start working through them, it becomes clear that it's different types of information. Um, but no, you don't need to have different catalogs, you just need to have different versions or views of them. Thank you to Barclay for your pearls of wisdom. I know you've done this uh, several, several times before, Barclay, so um, it's really good to have the view of someone who's actually had so much experience in doing this. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you. I've been Patrick Bolger, so thank you very much.